Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ed Lamonte, and I'm the chairman of the Simsbury Aging and Disability Commission. And I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. This is the second in our series of Living Longer, Stronger, Advocating for Your Healthcare Needs series. Uh, tonight is the Care Transitions a Behind the Scenes Look, Making the Most of Your 12-Minute Doctor's Appointments. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Jacqueline Bramzik. Uh, Jackie attended Boston College and earned a Master's of Social Work degree with a concentration in older adults and families in 2012. She has worked for years to advocate for older adults within marketing and care management roles in both community-based and residential settings. At Weatherby and Associates, she supports the client's personal health care needs, which may arise in conjunction with their legal needs. She utilizes her education and experience to connect clients with community resources they may need to assess as they age such as service organizations, home health care, and nursing homes. She provides comprehensive assessments to develop a care plan that supports the client's overall well-being. She is on the board of directors of ITN Central Connecticut, and she's also the freshman girls basketball coach at Simsbury High School. <laughs> Prepping them for UConn. So Dr. Kevin Barron, has served as the hospice medical director at McLean Home Care and Hospice since 2011. He earned a BS from Tufts University in biology and Spanish. He continued his graduate education in medicine and public health at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Dr. Barron then traveled to Peru for his field work where he worked with local communities along the Amazon River. He completed his internship and residency at Yale University. Dr. Barron was uh, selected to be a National Health Services Corps Scholar, has received numerous honors and recognitions during his clinical career, including being awarded for his competency in diabetes care leadership. He is certified in internal medicine and is a member of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, the American College of Physicians, and the National Physicians Alliance. He is among the first in the nation to earn the new Hospice Medical Director Certification, HMDC. Dr. Barron is part of the ProHealth Physicians and his private office is located in Plainville, Connecticut. So on behalf of the commission, uh, I'd like to thank you both for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, it is a small group, it's an intimate group, which is fantastic. It really lends itself well to discussion. We're gonna present some PowerPoint slides, which you should have in front of you. Um, feel free to stop us at any point, ask any questions you may have, because somebody else is probably thinking the same thing. Um, this is all about you guys tonight, and we want you to get something out of it. We're gonna tag team back and forth. I hope it doesn't confuse any of you, but we find that uh, it's a little bit more informal that way. All right, so this is what we're going to accomplish this evening. We're going to, uh, we already did introductions, and then we're going to go through the following slides. What to do before your visit with your provider, who, you, who, should, who should attend, what to do if you're running late, what's actually going to happen at the visit, some tips on that, before you leave, and then what to do after your visit. We'll also be sure to leave time for any questions or comments. And again, as Dr. Barron said, please chime in at any time with questions. We'll make sure to reiterate them for the group. Um, and we want to make this a very collaborative you know, discussion. Uh, so thinking about steps that you need to take before your visit, um, we wanted to highlight the word research. Take the time to um, really think about who you're going to see. If it's someone that is new to you, um, get an idea of what their background is, or if, even if it's someone that you've seen before, really take the time to sit down and understand what member of your overall healthcare team you're going to see. So is it your primary care physician? Is it um, a specialist like a cardiologist, uh, urologist, psychiatrist, so on? Uh, many of us have several members of what I like to call the healthcare team, and we also need to make sure to remember that they don't always communicate to each other. So it's really you know, our responsibility as the patients, and I say our because we're all patients. Um, our focus today, our discussion is more talking about older adults, but um, we've all needed to be in situations where we have to really advocate for ourselves um, or for our loved ones. Um, so some of the 
things that we've um, added to this slide here involve writing down key questions and concerns that you want to make sure are addressed in your very brief meeting <laughs> with the doctor. Um, Getting briefer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, really even going so far as to outline an agenda and starring the items on the agenda that are of most importance to you and showing that to, you, to your doctor and letting him or her know, you know really what's been on your mind. So that can't be overemphasized. Uh, when you walk into the room, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use doctor here because I'm a doctor, but certainly this would apply obviously to um, all of the providers uh, that take care of uh, everybody here. Uh, but it's really important to know what you want to get out of the visit because the doctor is going to have their own agenda. We're going to have questions for you that we're going to run down. We're going to have a plan. Maybe they have a specific item that they're going to talk to you about. But your needs need to be addressed just as much as the provider's needs. So that's very important. Another really essential step in preparing for the appointment is making sure that you have the most complete and up-to-date medication list uh, for yourself or for your loved one if you're visiting with and advocating for a loved one. Understanding um, what medications you're on currently, what the doses are, how often you're taking them, and that also really needs to include things like vitamins, over-the-counter things that you're taking. We can never assume that um, our provider is aware of everything that we're, that we're taking. I'm always blown away by the number of supplements uh, that people take. They're not necessarily suggested by me or recommended by me or even told to me. Uh, but when you start asking, um, it blows my mind sometimes. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're harmless, but sometimes they can be quite harmful. One of the great things about all of our electronic medical records is it automatically does a safety check. Some of your pharmacists do this already, uh, but it's a way for me to know what you're taking and I can see exactly how they interact with one another because there are significant interactions that need to be talked about in that list. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one on is paperwork. Uh, how many of you, when you go to the doctor, do you get something in the mail ahead of time to complete? Anyone here? No? Couple? Yeah. That's a big time saver. Uh, if, if someone walks into the room and uh, so it gives you a packet of information, which I'm a little guilty of sometimes, something called an annual wellness visit. Have you heard of that? AWV from Medicare? It's a, um, it's a fantastic opportunity to talk with your doctor about some of the preventive visits or preventive uh, things that you can do, screen tests, et cetera, and things you can do at home to make sure you're safe from falling. Um, but it takes time. It takes time to complete it accurately and completely. And if I hand that to you in the visit, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy. So you want to spend your 12 minutes filling out this form. So oftentimes, we'll send it to the patient ahead of time. Uh, so it'll be all complete for you that you can complete, and also often a loved one can help you complete, which when you're dealing with older patients is very helpful. So just to go through some of the expectations um, from my perspective, uh, the, seeing a doctor, you know, we've all seen doctors, but how many of you have ever had a course on how to see a doctor? No one, right? In medical school, we do get courses on how to see patients, uh, some more than others, <laughs> some remember it more than others, but here are some things from my perspective. Uh, the first thing is to relax. We really, really are on your side, even if it seems like we're a little bit rushed sometimes, even if it seems like we're not paying attention. I hope that never happens, but we're on your side. We're here because we want to help you or your loved one. Uh, up the upfront with who you are as a patient or as a family. Are you a difficult patient or a family? You might not know, uh, but I recently have a patient who was a difficult patient. And instead of letting me find that out on my own, he told me. He says, a brand new visit, and he said, listen, I am a difficult patient. And what that did for me was it allowed me to give him extra time and be very patient with him because I knew, he told me, he's a difficult patient. And so every visit with him, it was an interesting, challenging relationship. <laughs> he had fired every other doctor he had ever had for. 50 years, um, but it was fantastic because it allowed us to be very patient with each other, know where we're coming from, and it's really that upfront honesty um, that makes that interaction and communication go well. And then along the lines of um, communication, as a social worker, I really felt it was important to emphasize that um, communication styles and principles really are always going to apply in this situation as they would in other aspects of our lives. So we have to make sure to understand as we're going to see the doctor that we can never assume that they know what's on our minds or what's been going on with us. And so we need to make sure never to make those assumptions. And also um, 
to remember that you can never, you can't change the communication style of others, as we know in our everyday lives, but it's also in our medical visits. But we can always work to change on, to change our communication styles to make sure that our needs are really being met. So it's it's important to think about um, because I know a lot of us they, we could be a little bit intimidated going to see a doctor, and it's sometimes you know a person of authority that that might throw us off. But we have to make sure to sort of center ourselves and think about communication style in general. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's important to be heard. It's important, like I said before, it's important for you to be heard as much as I have my own agenda and I want to talk to you about your high blood pressure, your high cholesterol, your diabetes, and your hip fracture all on the same visit in the 12 minutes. It's important that you are heard and your, um, your needs are conveyed. And one of those ways is really knowing ahead of time so you don't get caught in <laughs> like a deer in the headlight when you um, see me, because that happens. I know, you know, I'm, I'm beautiful, but uh, often it does happen. People get very concerned. And very and intimidating. And right? then all of a sudden they forget everything. So that's why it's important. And, and then the last one, it's, it's a little bit unfair of me to ask uh, this of you guys, but be punctual. Um, that is important because a lot of doctors, if you're late, they will not see you. They will not see you 10 minutes late, two minutes late, or 20 minutes late. Um, they will ask you to reschedule. And man, what a bummer that is because you've spent all this time and effort to get there. Um, and so we really ask you to be punctual, even if we are not. <laughs> Yeah, and I do like to emphasize as well that, you know, um, a lot of us are going to a lot of different doctors and we're spending a lot of our time going to doctors. So while their time is also valuable, it's of course extremely valuable, so is yours. So make the most of it, you know, and, and try to strive to be punctual so that you can move on with the rest of your day <laughs> and other doctor's appointments potentially. <laughs> I don't know. It happens. Uh, our but. next discussion is, you know, around, and this is very helpful in terms of Dr. Barron's um, perspective as well, but who should or should not attend a doctor's appointment? Who goes to their doctor's appointment alone? Anyone go alone? A couple of you, and who goes with other people? Nobody, oh, just one person. Uh, so it, it, the rooms can be small, rooms can be big, uh, regardless of geographic uh, char physical characteristics, more is not always better. Um, so you have to think about who you want to attend the visit. And some of these are tongue in cheek, um, but, you know, being a, a caregiver is very helpful. So if you have someone you're taking care of or if, if someone is taking care of you, then certainly having that uh, third-party perspective can be incredibly helpful to the doctor. Uh, family or a power of attorney uh, for the same exact reasons that we talked about. Their concerns uh, may be different than that of the patients as well. Uh, spouse, of course, they've got that perspective. Um, what about the following? You know, a nosy neighbor, a concerned friend, a litigation lawyer, not, not you, right? Okay. A uh, grandchildren, day litigate. program employee, <laughs> mailman or grocer. So you laugh, but I've seen a lot of these. <laughs> it happens. Uh, sometimes they're just a ride, uh, which is, can be very helpful to, for the patient to get there. But if you're just a ride, if you're just a grocer, then you probably should wait outside in the waiting room while I talk with the patient alone. Um, so it's something to be, to be thoughtful about. So, so the question involved uh, taking a uh, loved one who might be having some dementia or memory problems to the doctor and how to negotiate that interaction um, with the doctor. And I've got two comments for you. One is it depends on whether you want the patient to be there for your discussion or not. Most of the time, you want the patient there, and there's no problem with that. But there certainly are, I imagine, and I see this, there are times when I will get from a spouse or from... Um, a, a, a daughter or a son, uh, what do they call that? They call that children, a child. Yeah. <laughs> Think of that word, <laughs> from a child. Uh, some concerns that they don't want the other person to know that they've got those concerns. Particularly the very sensitive topic about memory. My husband is losing his memory, but he doesn't know it. He just gets mean, irritable, and angry. And so they I want to approach that, obviously, not in that threesome. Um, and they can do that different ways. Some people leave me a message ahead of time, I'm not anonymous. You say, this is the spouse of so-and-so. <laughs> Some will write me a, a letter 
slip it to me. A little fancy. I leave the, I leave the room, I read it, and I come back. Uh, depends on how with it the patient is. Um, or they can literally say, uh, can I talk to you alone for a minute? It depends on what, what, what the style is. In that case, the patient is going to know that you're talking about them. <laughs> um, but then as we're going to talk about later, if there are specific, very sensitive concerns that might take a little bit more time to go through, you can actually have a visit without the patient. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah, and that's something that I learned from Dr. Barron in preparing for this. But also another thing that I would suggest, again, from a social work perspective, is being mindful of, and I've been in this position as an advocate, going to the doctor with a client, of being mindful of not just talking about the person um, when, they're, when they're sitting right there, including them in the discussion as much as possible. Now, there, are, there might be situations where that, that's not appropriate. Um, but just being mindful of sort of their, their general dignity and well-being um, in collaborating with them in the discussion and not, right, taking the focus away from the patient. Um, you know, collaborating as a caregiver to say, you know, this is something that we've noticed together. You know, Dr. Barron, how can we help? How can you help mm -hmm. us with that? Yeah. It, it can be a great way to approach some sensitive topics that way as well. Um, but, but that being said, you want to be mindful. If, you're, if someone's in a room um, and you kind of know them and you kind of want them there, but you kind of don't, you know, we're going to be talking about some embarrassing topics, potentially. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about bowel movements and urination and sex and some crazy stuff that may or may not want that grocer in the room. <laughs> right. So that's why I brought that up. <laughs> and it's a small room usually, so <laughs> and, we don't want the whole neighborhood. And if they're in the room, then I'm going to assume that it's okay to talk about anything and everything. So, <laughs> say it again. In what way? Yeah, I, I mean, run into that and then I'll... Yeah, I mean, I could speak to that a little bit. And since I do represent a, a law firm, we're uh, Weatherby and Associates in Bloomfield, as, as was mentioned prior. Um, it is possible to develop, um, and often doctor's offices will inquire about this specifically, as I'm sure you can speak to, um, sure. a, a HIPAA or privacy statement that says, you know, the following people are involved friends or family members that I am comfortable with having knowledge of my, my care needs. Uh, it does not mean that they can make decisions on, the, on my behalf as a patient, for example. Um, as long as there's permission granted by the patient, um, my understanding, you can speak to that too, is that that's okay. It is implied that that person is, is mm -hmm. authorized to hear about care needs and next steps, things like that. And often somebody will, um, who I don't know if it's okay to share that information, if the patient's not right there to ask, um, I can say, I, I will listen to your concerns. I will hear anything you have to tell me but I'm not at liberty to share with you any details of the treatment or the diagnosis or whatever it is. And then we also we have the formal forms, of course, designated who is allowed to hear formally and get, receive information. So what do you do if you're late? Because <laughs> it happens, believe it or not. It does happen. So the first thing is to don't panic. Uh, I don't want you to get in a car accident on the way because you're late or, God forbid, run in the winter, break your hip on my way into the office on your way to the office. Uh, but you want to call as soon as you can. If you're going to be a little bit late versus a lot of it late, uh, there's a big difference. And every doctor at office is going to handle that differently. Um, some are going to say, no problem. The doctor is running late anyway. Just get here when you can. Some will say, forget about it. The doctor's got a late schedule. He's not going to see you late. Um, and so it, it really does depend on the doctor. We tend to be a little bit more flexible in my office, understanding that uh, traffic happens or particularly if you're taking somebody with you, um, all kinds of mishaps can happen along the way. Uh, and then reschedule if necessary. Now, what to do <laughs> if the doctor is late? Why is the doctor late? I am here. He asked me to be on time. Why is he late? How is this allowed? Um, and, it, and it does happen. I know. It's shocking. Um, but believe it or not, a lot of things go on before your appointment. And so I just wanted to take a minute to shed light on that. Um, hospital patients, uh, I go to the hospital every single morning before I start my office. So just because you have an appointment at 9 in the morning, unfortunately, doesn't mean I'm going to be there at 9 in the morning if an unexpected emergency happens in the hospital. A lot of doctors these days aren't doing the hospital, so they wouldn't have that excuse, um, but I still do. And so I, let me tell you, I've been um, late on several occasions because something happens I wasn't anticipating, and I'm late. People are great about it. They completely understand. If you 
were in the hospital and you had an emergency, you, you would want me to take that extra time. Uh, nursing home patients, so nursing home patients have 24 hour level care um, and emergencies happen overnight. They happen in the morning. Uh, there are faxes that come in that are things that just can't wait. Because if I start my day at nine in the morning, I'm probably not gonna get a second to do it until probably lunchtime. And so something, there are some things that can't wait. So there's faxes that have to be dealt with uh, before I see you in the first thing. Lab review, phone calls, same exact thing. Overnight, we took your blood at two in the afternoon, guess when it comes back? It comes back at 11 and 12 at midnight. Um, so when you come in in the morning, it's right there. And all of our electronic medical systems, they star abnormal or critical results, and all of those need to be dealt with in a very timely fashion. So it's very possible that I'm dealing with that before I see you at 9 a.m. Uh, same thing, visiting nurses who go into the home, they may leave messages that have to be dealt with that cannot wait until 12.30. Faxes, mail, you see the point, you see, you see the pattern here. Um, walk-ins, there are definitely walk-ins that happen. Not every doctor's office accepts walk-ins. Uh, in my office, we do. And then um, it's possible that they, we had a walk-in that was an emergency they had to see before your visit. And it's never fun to do that because you have an appointment at 9 a.m. Um, but the reality is sometimes in my office that does happen. Some standard utility emergencies, <laughs> family emergencies. Uh, traffic and car accidents. Uh, that's happened to me. I was traveling when I used to work in New Haven on, 90, on, on Route 9 to going to 91 South and an accident happened before my very eyes. And of course, I attended to it along with three other doctors, which was very helpful uh, because there was a critical accident. But, um, but I was four hours late <laughs> because I was dealing with it. I told my patients to reschedule but when I walked in four hours late, they were all waiting for me. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a very long day. Um, but just like these things happen to you, they happen to us too. I guess you're very, very popular. They were willing to wait all day. <laughs> so who are the people in the room? Who are all these people? So you bring your people and we bring our people. <laughs> so um, a nurse, I guarantee you're going to have some contact with a nurse throughout your visit. They may or may not be in the room. Often if there's a sensitive exam, you may be asked for if a nurse can be in the room, um, or there may be one there automatically. A scribe, who knows what a scribe is? Anyone seen a scribe before? These are um, people who are employed by the doctors, and they are there to be a third party, literally just to write down everything that happens so that I don't have to do it later. So increase the efficiency of the visit and make my time more eye time with you, face time with you, um, so that I don't have to do that note-taking aggressively. Because I'm sure you've seen it, doctors stare at the screen a little bit more than they stare at you, and that's never a great feeling. It is becoming more the norm. Yeah, I mean, certain fields are doing it more and more. Emergency room visits I've seen, they kind of all have a scribe these days. Um, in my office, uh, my partner has a scribe, I don't. Uh, so it, in our office, it's optional. And within ProHealth, it's also optional. Um, but it is becoming more and more common. Uh, medical assistant, of course, you know, uh, teaching, medical assistants, uh, I'm sorry, medical students are in my office. Uh, residents are also in my office, and they're optional. Uh, oftentimes, they'll see you before I see you and prov uh, provide some of that information uh, to me, and then we go in and see the patient together, but you'll always still see me, um, but some fellows as well. And so you also ha always have that option. If you don't feel like seeing a medical student, if you don't feel like seeing a medical resident, you can always say, I would prefer not to have a student with me. And I would imagine, too, it, it never hurts to ask if you're confused about who somebody is. Um, I, I know in yeah. my work as, a, as an advocate uh, through the law firm, we see a lot of situations with folks who have a lot of people coming in and out of their home. So a slightly different scenario because mm -hmm. we're going to the doctor's office. But there's, there tends to be some rather normal confusion about you know, which agency someone represents. Are they with a visiting nurse? Are they with a non-medical home care? You know, it, it's very confusing and overwhelming, mm -hmm. and the same can be true in, in going into a doctor's office. So, you know, when in doubt, ask, uh, and it's important to not make assumptions again about mm -hmm. who somebody might be uh, along this, this spectrum here. My hope would be they would introduce themselves, make yes. themselves <laughs> known, um, but you're exactly right. If you don't know, you should definitely ask. I know a lot of the hospitals where I work at the Hospital of Central Connecticut, uh, people are in same colored uniforms. So the medical, so the nurses are all in blue, the secretaries are all in green, the PCAs are all in, et cetera. So they try to make that easier. 
All right. Chit chat. That's your favorite topic. <laughs> it is my favorite topic. Yeah. So this is the visit. You made it. <laughs> You're on time. The We're doctor's here. on time. You have your priority in front of you, which is fantastic. Um, so I like that. Chit chat, of course. This is your doctor. This is someone you have a long-term relationship. Hopefully, someone you want to get to know. They care about you. You care about them. Um, chit chat, but not too much. You really only have 12 minutes or whatever the case may be. Uh, and I have, uh, when I have a new patient, I just had one recently, who we instantly liked each other. And we're talking a lot. But she told me a lot of information, which was great, but very irrelevant to her medical care. And it was a wonderful social visit. We could have been at a coffee shop, um, but that was the whole visit. And I kept interrupting to say, you know, unfortunately, I'd like to talk about this. We only have about 10 more minutes. We only have about six more minutes. We only have about two more minutes. And, it, and I don't time it like that, of course, but the point is um, it's lovely getting to know her and I, on all my patients, but um, we are a little bit on a schedule. So uh, I say that, I hope you don't take that the wrong way. We, we, we do like talking with you a lot. Uh, prioritize. So you want to, given your limited time, you want to take out your list of priorities and you want to make sure that you're going to hit every single one of them. And so maybe your big toe hurts today and that's great, but maybe that's not the big issue for the day. Maybe it's the chest pain you're having. And so you want to prioritize. And if there's more time, then you talk about the big toe pain. It's maybe important. Because um, the doctor's going to probably have some agenda items too. Certainly in my training, we were taught to get out your agenda right away. Okay, we've, we have about 12 minutes today. What would you like to talk about? Chest pain. Okay. Anything else? Diabetes. Great. Anything else? My big toe. Great. Anything else? My left eyebrow. Anything else? And you want to get it out. So we can help you prioritize if you're having a problem with that. Um, but we, so we know. Because what we want to avoid, um, I think I put it somewhere later, we want to avoid what I call the, the doorknob question, which is I think we're done with the visit. We had a lovely visit. It's time to go. And I say, goodbye, I'll see you in three months. And I put my hand on the doorknob and the patient says, wait, I forgot to tell you about my chest pain. That's the last thing I want to happen. Because of course, you can't ignore that. That's a really big deal. Um, but you, you don't want that to happen. And, you know, we mentioned uh, taking notes as well, of course. Um, and sometimes it might be more appropriate for the person that's there advocating with you, like the caregiver or family member, to take the notes on your behalf as you're listening to the doctor intently. <laughs> Maybe you might want to have somebody else take the notes, depending on, you know, your, your own skill scribe. Level. Yes, your own scribe, <laughs> shall I say, yes. Um, so, so, you know, that's vital. I know I've done that with clients where they might turn to me after and say, okay, so what did you say? You know, and I could say, okay, well, this, this is how I understand it. And then we can um, follow up by asking for clarification, hopefully within that meeting. So if there's something that Dr. Barron has said that I don't understand, I can say, wait, back up. Explain that to me again, I don't understand it. Instead of maybe having to review, looking at the notes later and calling back um, and entering into that system, which can also happen too, um, but really asking for that clarification and working collaboratively with whoever's with you. So we really do consider it a failure if you walk out or your loved one walks out with unanswered questions or concerns. So it, it's a fail, it's a failed visit, it's a failed communication, it's a failed opportunity um, for a two-way communication. So it's important to get everything um, done in a timely fashion, but the way you guys want. Awkward areas, of course, there are always awkward areas. Not for me. I talk about awkward areas all day long, much to my family's chagrin. <laughs> um, but really, don't leave out any details. We need to know. And if we, if we don't care from you, then we'll ask. Um, and it, it shouldn't be embarrassing. This is all a part of life. Take responsibility, of course, for your own health, for your own questions, um, for your own plan of care. We want you guys involved just as much as we want to be involved. And you do need to really be willing to share, you know, to talk about the things that, as Dr. Barron say, can be awkward. Things like incontinence, um, how you're feeling, you know, um, a chronic ailment that a lot of us, or a chronic condition a lot of us deal with is depression. Uh, it's something that we don't think about necessarily because it's not something tangible, like a, like a cut on your arm or something like that. But it's, you know, these are emotions that should be discussed. And then the doctor can then take that information and, and help with your plan of care or refer you to another professional. So you really need to be willing to share. And if you're not willing to share or not in agreement with what the doctor is saying, then you have to be willing to express that as well. Um, and potentially the doctor, well, the, the doctor can, can understand this in the meeting and then come up with an alternate plan uh, or alternate advice or an alternate professional mm -hmm. um, to, to look to because 
you might not always click. Um, but, but you have to be willing to, to, to say that, and that's the best use of your time, instead of walking out the door and saying, well, that, that was a waste, I didn't like him or her, and I didn't feel comfortable with them. That's, you know, that could happen as well, but you have to be willing to express yourself in, in terms of that accountability and responsibility as the patient. So it's not a typo. <laughs> it's, <laughs> ask questions is there three times, um, because it's really important. We really want you to understand uh, everything. If you have a question about a medication that I give you, I say, great, I need you to start Lipitor. And you don't know what Lipitor is, I'm assuming you do, you need to ask me what that is. And, I, and yes, I should be telling you, um, but if I don't, then you need to, to ask me what it is. You need to ask me about the side effects, how it's gonna interact with the other medications, how it's gonna affect your health, why you're taking it. If no one taught you that, you need to, you need to be, um, learn why you're taking it. Um, all those questions are, are really important to know. Uh, the the doorknob door question. question. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, actually, while we're talking about asking questions <laughs> three times? That was good. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh, okay. So um, I can touch a little bit on knowledge of events care planning and advanced directives. Um, as I mentioned before, I work with uh, Weatherby and Associates. We're a life care planning law firm in Bloomfield. Uh, some of these, these concepts that we're touching on here in many cases might not come into play in your routine doctor's appointment. Um, they are things to keep in mind, especially for hospital visits uh, and certain emergency situations. But it's really just a note to emphasize planning for future healthcare needs um, with someone like an attorney um, who has this unique perspective of really wanting to make sure that you as a patient and as a person are really thriving despite, you know, a lot of the things that you could be living with from a medical perspective. Um, just so that's just, a, I guess, sort of a, a plug for what we do, but also just an understanding of what medical profession or what legal professionals are really um, trained and able to help you with these things. So elder law, estate planning, attorneys like Attorney Weatherby, who I work for. Um, another thing to keep in mind when it comes to, we put here power of attorney, is everyone familiar with that term or have one power of attorney? So um, as I touched on before, there is a difference in terms of people that you designate. Um, there are folks that can be included on your HIPAA or privacy statement to say this, these are people that I want to discuss care with. But uh, going a step further is, is designating someone who is typically a family member as your power of attorney. Um, there are two different types, one being your financial power of attorney um, and the other being a health care power of attorney who would more likely come into play in these scenarios. Um, that person is someone that you've designated to potentially make decisions around healthcare needs on your behalf. Um, and it's also vital that that person be someone that has your best interest in mind and absolutely, well, that's extremely important, but also equally important, um, you know, understanding what your wishes are and what you would want. So if there is a scenario, a healthcare scenario in which you are not able to advocate for yourself, um, your, your capacity is such that you, you can't make these decisions. Um, that is when a power of attorney would be able to step in and make decisions on your behalf. That's, um, that's really important. So yes. it's only if you can't make decisions for yourself. Right. You can have a power of attorney, and a lot of us, like we said, we do, but it does not mean that we, don't, we stop making decisions and speaking up and advocating for ourselves. And if our power, power of attorney doesn't quite agree, that's too bad. <laughs> Depends on the scenario. <laughs> I'm generalizing, but yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the question, that's a very good question. Um, yes, the question being, um, a lot of folks have family members, but what if you don't to designate as a power of attorney? Um, that is the case with some of our clients. That's the case with a lot of folks. Um, you can designate whoever you'd like. I mean, it could be a close friend, somebody that, obviously somebody that knows you very well and is in a position to be close by. You know, someone that can be there for you for doctor's appointments, for example, for hospital visits. Um, that's a good question for an elder law attorney. Um, someone that you are working with collaboratively to determine what goes on that paper. You know, um, uh, understanding who in your life can be identified uh, it, again, it depends, <laughs> but it is, it, it is a situation a lot of people run into. They don't have involved family members. Some people have 
seven children. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not ideal to identify all seven of your children to have, um, you know, decision-making ability in the case of uh, not being, not holding the proper capacity. So working with an elder law attorney to determine, you know, who makes the most sense and how to properly educate all of your family members and your power of attorney is extremely important for future or, or current, yeah. you know, health needs. Yeah, you really want to uh, be very deliberate about that decision because right. they are acting on your behalf for your interests. And it takes a little bit of thinking change because it's not what they would want, it's yep. what you want. So what you have to represent them in your mind. And when I'm in the intensive care unit and there's a catastrophe and there's a very ill patient who can't make decisions for themselves, I constantly have to remind family members, this isn't about you, this mm -hmm. is about her. What would she want done? And a lot of times you've had that discussion with your doctor as well. That's and right. so they can say, well, when I talked to her about this, she said she would never want to be uh, maintained on life support. Has she ever said that to you? And you can have that conversation. So certainly we always recommend talking about it with your doctor, but also with family members who are making those decisions for you. Yeah, and another key document along those lines is the living will. I know a lot of us have heard about your will, which is a document that comes into play upon death, but your living will, including what you would want for in different healthcare scenarios. Um, and they can be as complex or as simple as you would like them to be. <laughs> um, uh, we like them to be as comprehensive as possible because it needs to incorporate a lot of different situations that could arise that, again, a lot of people are hesitant to talk about. So speaking about them with your doctor, with your attorney, with your loved ones, um, you know, as a team for you is, is really crucial. So there's... And, the, and there, there's are documents, yeah. <laughs> there are documents that make that easier, mm -hmm. provide a little outline. There's one called Seven Wishes that makes an outline of what to talk about with your family if you don't know really how to bring it up. Um, and and uh, these are a little bit different. There's advanced directives, and there's living wills, and, and they are different. Um, and we're talking a little bit about it, but you know the last the last line there is this code status or advanced directive. What would you would want to do in the event of an emergency? Uh, would you want to be resuscitated? I'm sure you've all heard of DNR. Um, and that tech, that ver that uh, term is still in existence today, but they're really switching a little bit to the AND allow natural death, which really, if you think about the difference, they're subtle, mm -hmm. but it makes a lot more sense because that's what happens. A, per a person is dying or they're dead and you either allow that or you try to bring them back. And versus the do not resuscitate, it's implying that somebody can be resuscitated and do you want to resuscitate them? That may and or often may not you'll be, be asked true. again, more likely in a hospital setting, but also in Usually, the in the, yeah, definitely in a hospital the doctor's setting. office. You know what is what is the code status? You know, and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're often looking for that type of language and also proper documentation in the case of a DNR or the allowed natural death to be signed by the physician. Yeah, um, and after a conversation. Yeah. I didn't hear the question. Can you say it again? Do we provide the information? Yeah, I mean, in, in one of the required uh, forms or one of the required topics on that Medicare annual wellness visit is talking about these. So your provider, your doctor, should really be talking to you um, whenever they do one of these wellness exams for Medicare, um, but really at any time. It's very important. If, yeah. Um, and we all need to understand as professionals that your opinions could change. You know, you could they come do. in, you know, and if they do change, then we have to make sure that those conversations are had and the documents are up to date to, that are in line with that, that, you know, that paradigm shift that you might have about decisions for yourself yeah. or loved and they, one. And they require education. You know, when I talk to people about, well, what do you want to do about code status? You know, oh, God, I'm a DNR. Well, hold on. You're 28. <laughs> You're healthy. What does that mean, DNR to you? Well, if I'm a vegetable, I want to be resuscitated. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you had an emergency in the moment, we try to get you going again. Well, of course you do, right? Of course we do. You're not DNR. <laughs> Very big difference. 
uh, out of time. So you had your visit, and um, if you are out of time, the doctor has indicated that it's time to move on, or certainly if you have indicated that it's time uh, to move on. Um, they're going to ask you to schedule another visit, of course. Uh, this is particularly important if you had 18 items on your list, and unfortunately you only got to five of the really important ones that you start ahead of time. Uh, you can always uh, schedule another visit. You can ask for an alternate communication avenue. So this is getting to your question. Um, if there is something that you want to talk about not in front of the patient, then certainly an alternate uh, communication avenue is the way to go. Um, or if you leave the office and you say, oh my gosh, I have this Lipitor, but I forgot to ask him um, what it's for. Then you want to you get that question answered. And you could, there's phone. Now, every doctor is going to be different, but certainly there's phone options, email options, portals. I'm sure you've seen uh, portals that have some communication capability in the form of email, usually through the portal, um, and then letters. And my patients have used all of these, and you should find out from your doctor what's the preferred way that you can communicate with him. <laughs> it amazes how many letters I get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before you leave that office, do you want to do, do this? Well, uh, uh, Dr. Bear and I were just uh, talking about this too beforehand. Every doctor's office is different, but many of which um, do provide you with a printout to say, okay, this is a general, a very general overview of what we've discussed and what new medications have been prescribed, and also the vital question of when is my next visit. Um, if they don't just provide that, I, you can always ask, because I think that's a good takeaway, and it's certainly something you can jot down in your notes, but I think many doctor's offices now do provide that printout. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of encompasses kind of the, a lot of the things that were that we touch on in this slide. Um, you know, what's changed and giving another opportunity to check that out and say, oh, wait, I have one other question. Mm -hmm. Or this date and time that I just set is actually not going to work for me. Or, you know what I mean? Just making sure that you're walking out with, um, you know, a clear view of, of what's going to happen next in your next expected trip to the doctor. We send out um, a clinical summary, and it has a lot of good information on it. And the, I can't tell you how many times patients will come back for their three-month follow-up and say, hey, you sent me this clinical summary. Remember we talked about this? I'm not on this medication anymore. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to note that. You know, so it's a really good way for you to see what your doctor sees and to make sure that everything is accurate. And also revising, you said your general contact information. Has your phone number changed? Do you have a new cell phone? Is there a new address? Making sure that your doctor's aware of that always is going to be more helpful to do in person. Absolutely. Um, after the visit, uh, something that I like to talk about to keep in mind in terms of we're talking about a, a lot of overall themes here with keeping lists of our concerns, writing down questions, taking diligent notes. Um, one thing that I have suggested to a lot of folks is to keep a, a personal health care journal. So a notebook that is designated just for that purpose and is kept somewhere secure and accessible uh, on your bedside table, for example. I don't know. <laughs> um, but being able to jot down symptoms, questions, side effects, thinking about how things have changed since you've been prescribed the new medication, um, what the trends are, how often you're feeling symptoms, does anything make your symptoms better or worse? Um, really taking the time in a journal like that, and what I stress is that time, that those weeks or months or years that might happen between your visits with your doctor so that you can... Years. Well, no, <laughs> never years. <laughs> we'll say weeks. <laughs> Depends. Um, but really taking the time as you're thinking of it uh, to, to jot down some of those thoughts so that you can go back and look at them when you're about to visit the doctor again and say, oh, yeah, I'm noticing that. I really was having trouble sleeping a lot, or I still am, um, so that you can maybe correlate that with getting a new prescription or stopping a prescription, yeah. just, you know, discontinuing it, for example. Um, so I guess it's kind of a cheesy suggestion, but I like it because it's something that you can do in order to sort of really take control and self-advocate, as we're saying here, um, and yeah. bringing that with you and utilizing that for your notes. And so you're not kind of, I know personally, sometimes I'm guilty of this where I scribble a note down on a paper and then I put it somewhere else and I can't find it. And, you know, uh, or sometimes people use our, we use our phones, for example. It's just whatever's best for you to sort of keep your own healthcare record after you, you leave I, the office. I mean, I, I ask people to do that all the time in, in, in limited scenarios. You know, cholesterol medications you may or may not have heard, but they can cause side effects. 
Um, and so I tell people all the time, listen, this may or may not cause side effects. Find out, pay attention to it, um, look for these signs. And uh, often in your busy day, you might not necessarily realize it, but I don't want to hear in six months, <laughs> oh my gosh, all of a sudden I'm getting cramp, terrible cramps in my legs and I wonder if that's a medication. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, you'd rather not be cramming for the test of knowing that you have the doctor's appointment tomorrow and thinking about, <laughs> you know, what's changed where, you know, instead you can take those notes in the interim mm -hmm. after you visited and before you return. <laughs> So. It, can, it can be so helpful if you're having unexplained symptoms or right. um, at the moment your doctor doesn't know what's going on and he's going to do more testing. Uh, but keeping that journal so in the moment you can remember, oh, this made it better, this made it worse. Um, so you can have some kind of correlation. Maybe there's a pattern that uh, the doctor can use in the future, even if it doesn't make sense to you at the time. Mm -hmm. Did you know? So <laughs> did you know, uh, we touched on earlier, that the patient does not have to be present for a visit. Now, 99% of the time, the patient is, is uh, definitely present. Uh, but if you have a loved one that uh, has difficulty with ambulation, they can't get to the doctor's office necessarily, or you have particular concerns that you may or may not want the patient uh, to be privy to, um, as long as you're having a bona fide visit in the doctor's office, you can uh, have a visit through insurance, just like you would otherwise, um, with the patient not there. That's and again, that's something that I learned in, in working with Dr. Barron. Has anybody yeah. heard of that notion? Yeah, yes they will. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if you try to do that on the phone, have a 20 minute visit with the doctor, it's not gonna go over so well. <laughs> yeah, every doctor is uh, different. Um, uh, yep, they may ask that and the secretary may say, I don't know. <laughs> is that something that's common? And then they would ask the doctor, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, that you would want, if there's going to be an exchange of information, then yeah, absolutely, you would want to be uh, legal about it and make sure information can be provided. Yeah, and the question was, should the name of the person that would be take, trying to you know, take that appointment uh, be on the list of yeah. Yeah. people that you designate, just to clarify. But right. I, I, I've often heard concerns from people who may or may not be on the list, but again, it's a, that's a one-way direction. I'm hearing information, I'm absorbing it, but I'm not necessarily giving it back. And so, um, if you have those concerns. Uh, so every doctor is different, but we routinely do that um, in our office, particularly with older patients with memory difficulties um, or uh, some uh, other conflicts. <laughs> uh, but but, but it, it's going to be an insurance thing. So if you really truly want it to be a secret and you're billing it under that person's insurance, you have to be a little bit careful because then there's a visit that they didn't participate in. They're going to get a, a bill and say, hey, I didn't go to the doctor's on November 10th. Who, who is this? And so you have to be a little bit mindful of that as well. Uh, just some other things that I've run uh, across in some of my older patients that are important to know, and your doctor, of course, will know, um, but it's good for you to know. New vaccines, so there's a couple new ones. Uh, there's a Prevnar, which is a pneumonia vaccine, which everybody should have, in addition to the regular Pneumovax, so your other pneumonia vaccine. So everybody over the age of 65 needs both of those. There's a high-dose influenza, very timely. Um, but this does provide a little bit better protection for patients over 65. And if you haven't already gotten your flu shot and you're over 65, you should ask about the high dose option, which seems to be better. Um, and then there's the shingles shot or the zoster vaccine, um, which is an important vaccine for everybody indicated over 50 years old, although a lot of insurances won't pay until you're 60 years old. That's important to find out. You don't want to be stuck with a couple hundred dollars worth of a vaccine uh, bill. But there are some um, restrictions on who can get the Zoster vaccine. It's a live virus, and so you want to talk to your, doc to your doctor if it's right for you, which they will probably know more than the pharmacist necessarily giving out those vaccines, whether it's appropriate for you at the time. Dr. Barron, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Is shingles more prevalent in those over 65? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know that from my experience that it can be very painful and mm -hmm. damaging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyone, is, anyone can get shingles at any age, right. um, but certainly as you get older, the risk goes up, the prevalence goes up. Oh. What's the beers list? The beers list. So this is a list. Is um, it beer? Have you, anyone ever heard about beers list? It's not beer like drinking beer. <laughs> I wouldn't be talking about that. Uh, it's, a, it's an important list that doctors across the country have identified as medications that are high risk causing side effects in older patients, uh, specifically falls. 
So these are medications which we consider dangerous or higher risk. Um, and it's quite extensive. You'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but it's quite extensive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean never receive these because your doctor may or may not have any other options, but it is a list which your doctor should know about. Um, you don't have to memorize all of them. Uh, some things to avoid, if possible. Uh, sleep medications are on here, so Lunesta, Zolpidem, which is Ambien, some of the benzodiazepines, such as Ativan, Valium, Xanax, uh, commonly prescribed medications for sleep that really do increase your risk of having um, a side effect. Some heart medications, amiodarone, uh, digoxin, uh, those are the heart ones on there, uh, antipsychotics such as Haldol, um, Megase, which is a medication for an appetite stimulant. So if you don't know these, that's fine. A muscle relaxer, that's a big one too. You just fell, you've got some muscle pain. Um, it's innocent enough, oh, just take a muscle relaxer. And so they're just it's things to be aware as you get older. Medication, maybe it was started when you were younger and you're continuing on it, and maybe it needs to be reevaluated. So it's just to know that there's a list out there um, that's worried about protecting your safety. Interestingly enough, as they pointed out at a recent uh, hospice and palliative care meeting I went to, these are our go-to medications in hospice and palliative care. Uh, we don't really uh, pay attention to that because when you're on hospice, um, we worry a little bit less about the falls, but, um, but it's important to know. All right, guys. All right, well, again, I'd like to... Uh Thank Jackie, Dr. Barron, for being here. It was very informative. Uh, I do want to mention, as I mentioned previously, this was the um, second in a series of three presentations on the Living Longer, Stronger series. The third is going to be the impact of medication management on chronic diseases. And that will be held on November 29th. It will be again at 6.30 in this room. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you on the 29th. Thank you very much. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>